Welcome to another episode of the More God, Less Me podcast. My name is Justin, and I'm so glad that you've joined me today. The, t- the subject really says it all on this one. We're going to talk about how to overcome sin. I really feel like this is such an important topic, one that we talk a lot about sin in the church. It's kind of like everything that I've done so far on this podcast, really, is we talk a lot about these subjects, but we don't talk about the practical implication of these subjects or the practical application of these subjects. How do we actually do these things. So in this case, how do we actually win our battle with sin? How do we overcome the sins that are pre- plaguing us on a regular basis? I think a lot of times we just expect God to just make it all go away. We expect to either be able to pray it away or just expect that God's just, as soon as we become Christians, that we're no longer going to have the issues that we used to struggle with, the things that we were really deeply into or really honestly addicted to. I think that's a lot of the way that we think as Christians. is like, well, once we become a Christian, then these things are going to get a lot easier. And the truth is, sometimes they get harder because the devil comes at you more once he knows that he has lost you or is very close to losing you forever because you've given your life to Christ. So I, I just think that actually discussing how to overcome the battle with sin, the battle with temptation that happens to us on a regular basis is one of the most important things that we can talk about. Because sadly, sin is a prevalent issue in the church today. And many are struggling to find a way out. Sin is rampant in our world, and it makes its way into the church. It's a sad truth, but there's a lot of Christians or professing Christians who are still living in sin, who are still doing sinful things, and they want to get out. That's the thing. is, You, you can't really call yourself a Christian and practice sin and not look for a way out. Try to excuse your sins away, right? That doesn't work. However, there's a lot of people who truly love God but are still struggling in certain areas and want to get out. And if that's you, I hope to help you today just by sharing things from the Bible itself as well as like you know things that have, I've tried in my life or I've heard other people try in their life that have made a great impact and done very well. But you might ask yourself, why do we need to get out of sin if we've been saved by grace? It's kind of an odd question to ask, especially like in, in the case of people who really have spent a lot of time in the Bible, but for those who haven't, like, you may question that. You may wonder, but God saved me by grace. I'm not saved by the things that I do, but because of God's unending love for me. That's a very true statement. But, but it's not a completely true statement either, because the Bible teaches us that we should try to get out of sin. Paul was even facing the same question when he was speaking to the Romans, and so we actually have it in the Bible of this exact question. And so Paul says in Romans 6, 15 through 23, this is kind of a long passage, but I think it really helps to understand why we don't, why we need to make an effort to get out of sin. And it says, well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves of righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things that you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things which lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul's saying that you used to be a slave to sin, but now you are a slave to Christ. And as such, we shouldn't be a slave to sin anymore. We can't be a slave to two different things. We can't be given to two different things, and those two different things have two completely different outcomes. If we choose to give ourselves to sin, it will result in death. But if we choose to give our lives to Christ, then it will result in eternal life in heaven, which I think is what all of us are after as Christians, right? Later in the scripture, we are also told that children of God do not make a practice of sinning. This comes up in 1 John 3, 4 through 10, which says, Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, do not let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. 
But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil, and those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they cannot keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. And he says it in there that we do not make a practice of sinning. Right? That doesn't mean that we don't fall to sin. We're going to occasionally have issues with sin in our life as Christians. I mean, that's just the honest truth. We all struggle with things, and we're all not going to be perfect. Only one person ever lived a perfect life, and that was Jesus Christ, and that's what gave us our salvation. But there's a difference between falling to sin and making a practice of sin. And if we make a practice of sin, then we're not living the lifestyle that God requires of us. Okay? If we want to be saved, if we want to be in right standing with God, if we want to live the holy life that God has called us to live, then we must, and I do mean must, be purposeful, and we must be giving ourselves to Christ fully, living for Him and trying our best to stay away from sin, though if we do fall, the Bible also says we have an advocate with the Father, that is Jesus Christ, who we can come to when we have sinned, right? But if we continue to sin with no effort to stop, can we really say that we belong to God? I mean, that's what that verse is really telling us, isn't it? So we have to try to just agree with the Word of God and not be in sin. And finally, I like to look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 through 11, whenever I look at, at sin and the practice of sinning. And that says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning they will not go to heaven? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. These are referencing to sinful titles, not people who fell to these sins, but people who were living in these sins, and the people who live in those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. And some of us were like that, meaning that after salvation we're expected to be different. The Bible also says in other places to put on the new man, to take off the old man and put the new man on, one that's more in the image of Christ. Well, that requires us to not live in these lifestyles anymore. And so that's what Paul is saying there is like, look, you used to live like this, you used to be like that. But you're not like that anymore, and we can't be like that anymore in God. We must try to overcome our battles with sin, and we can do it through Christ. That's what's amazing. So, I also like that verse because, and this is just a side note, but it also reminds us that when we look out into the world and we see people doing these things, that we can remember that we too were just like that. We're no different than the world that's around us. They're given to the same lust that we're given to. And so when we look out at them, we see the same struggles that we've had. But it's sometimes easy as a Christian and somebody who's been saved for a time to forget those things, right? So we forget, oh, I used to actually do those very same things, and we struggle in that area. So these few verses help us to understand the central theme throughout the entire New Testament. It's because the Bible talks a lot about it. This isn't just one section of scriptures that talk about why we need to overcome sin. Really, the whole purpose of the New Testament is calling us out of sin and calling us to a better life in Christ. But what does it take to actually win or battle with sin? And I know that it may seem like silly to view what you're going through as a battle with sin, but the Bible says that we are fighting against principalities and rulers in the unseen world. In Ephesians 6 and 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And the truth is, is that Christians, we are at war with sinful desires and the lust of the flesh. And it can feel like we have no chance to win. Like sometimes it feels like we're outnumbered, that we're overpowered, because it's like it's constantly coming into your mind to do sinful things, to become prideful, to become greedy. That obsession with money comes back into your mind. Or if you battle with lust, and you're constantly battling lustful thoughts and this temptation to reach for things that you know that you shouldn't be reaching to, but it's constantly coming at you. And it can feel like something that you can't overcome. It can feel like something that like you're never going to win. But the thing is, is that is the tactic of the enemy. It's an attempt to remove all hope from us. The enemy wants us to think that we can't win, that we can't overcome sin, that we can't be better. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible tells us a completely different story. And the truth of the matter is, we have a cloud of witnesses throughout history who have overcome sin. Yes, there are also many people who were Christian leaders who didn't overcome sin, who hid sin, and who sins came out later, because what we do in darkness will come out in the light. But there are so many other Christians that don't get reported on who did give up their sinful ways, who did win their battles with sin, and sadly those aren't reported on, and that's why we need to share our testimonies and share what we've overcome. 
because that'll help other people realize that they can do the very same thing because our God promises that he is no respecter of persons. But the Bible does use terms like battle, armor, and training for a purpose. These are all found in the Bible, and I do believe that they're all there for a reason. They're not exaggerations made for effect like we often want to do, but these are true principles that I think God is trying to apply into our lives. If you think about a battle, no one ever comes back from a battle and thinks, well, that was easy. That's not the stories that you tell is of ease and comfort at battle. No one comes back from a war and talks about how easy it is. It talks about how difficult it is. And I believe that's what God was trying to convey when he uses those kind of terms when it comes to sin in our lives. God is trying to tell us that this isn't going to be easy, that it's going to be difficult, and that you're going to have to work to overcome it. I believe that that is the honest truth that we have in our Bible, that it's not going to be an easy thing to do. And like I said before, we think that God's going to simply remove the desire to sin when we pray, but that wouldn't prove anything about our real character or the real change that's taken place in our life. All that would prove is that God's a really good blocker. And what does that mean? Because we have free will, right? So we have to, the only way that it's going to prove that we truly love God, that we truly want to follow after God, is if we actually give up sin on our own without any sort of thing. And it's going to take daily sacrifice. We're going to have to crucify the flesh on a daily basis, giving up everything behind us because no one's going to do it for us. That's the other thing you have to remember is you have to make the choice to give up sin. Nobody can give up sin for you, but you have to do it. You have to choose to walk into battle. And that's something we don't often think about with like our soldiers and things like that. It's like, yes, they have, they have papers, they have, they're enlisted, but at the same time, they've made a choice to walk into the battle Every time they go out, they make a choice to step forward and to keep marching forward. And that's what we're going to have to do to overcome sin. We're going to have to make a choice on a regular basis to keep going forward. We even have verses in the Bible, like Luke 9.23, that says, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. It means it's going to be a daily choice to follow after Christ, to give up these sins. But you can do it. You can do it. It will get easier over time. And the voice of the flesh will be easier to ignore as we begin to focus and hear the voice of the Lord better every day. That's something to keep in mind is it's not it's not going to be you got to think about it like working out or training or something like that. Right. The more that you do it, the easier it's going to get. You're going to get stronger and you're going to get better. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's going to change completely, that the enemy's going to go away and we'll get into that later. But it's very important to realize that this isn't going to always be as hard as it is right now. Right, going into that battle, winning the battle, you know, taking on every force that the enemy's throwing at you will get easier over time. And that's a very important thing to remember. So still, but how do you do it, right? What do you do? Well, I think the best thing to do is to come up with a strategy to overcome the sin. No battle is won without a strategy. So in this case, we still need a strategy in order to win our battle with sin. And in my mind, the best things that we can do is to first start by identifying the sin that we struggle with regularly. Obviously, that's not going to be as hard as some other things might be, but that's where you need to start at, is what sin do I struggle with? What sin is keeping me from God? But what sin is also just where I fall? And then, what's the catalyst for this sin? Or or in another way to say that, it's like, what leads to committing this sin? What thing is there that I see, that I do that causes me to walk down a sinful path, um, then I think you need to equip yourself with the armor of God and then take it to God in prayer, as well as have an accountability group or partner, share with somebody. But we'll break these all down a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm starting to ramble. (coughs) Um, But I think that's how you come up with a strategy. What is my sin? What causes me to sin? And then, how do I equip myself with the armor of God? I need to take it to God in prayer, and I need to have other people in my life that know about what I'm struggling with and who can help me whenever times get tough, that I can rely on, that I can call a text, who will listen to me and help me when I need help. So, like I said, the first thing you need to do is identify where you struggle. What sin is it in your life? If you want to overcome a sin, you first must know what that sin is and what it is in your life. That way, you can spend time in the Bible. So, if you struggle with lust, if you struggle with greed, if you struggle with even theft. There's so many sins in the Bible. Pride, arrogance, right? Anger. If you struggle in these areas and you call, and you are constantly sinning in these areas, then you need to start studying that out in the Bible. You need to know what the Bible says about it and why you believe it is wrong. 
Really, you need to find those Bibles, study them, store them in your heart, know them, and know how to overcome that sin. Like, I think a lack of sin, I think a lack of understanding is part of the problem nowadays. I think that the issue is that people don't understand what the Bible says about the things they're struggling with, and so they have no desire to overcome those things. And so the more that you understand that the Bible really does tell me these things, and it tells me that these are the results of those things, then you're going to have a better understanding of why. So whatever your sin is, you need to take a moment and find all the verses you can, either if it's that's like a Thompson Chain Bible or cross-references. Sheesh. Um, Whatever it is, you need to find that in the Bible. Uh, the great thing you can do is search like Bible verses about blank, and you can fit anything in that blank, and you're going to get a ton of results with tons of Bible verses all around that one subject. And so if you struggle in an area, that might be one of the best things that you can do is to find Bible verses about that. But don't just read single verses. Make sure that you go into the full context of the passage because there may be things before or after that specific verse that apply to it and help you to have an even better understanding of the verse. But you need to know what you're sinning, what your sin is, which, let's just be honest, you do. You know what you're struggling with. Like, you don't really have to sit down and think about it, but you need to identify it first so then you can find those passages of Scripture. And then once you know what your sin is, what is causing you to commit that sin? Right? Like, if you, if you have an issue with pride... And you can't stop yourself from getting obsessed on Instagram with followers and likes and comments and things like that, then you may need to get off Instagram because pride comes before a fall, for one, but also you just need to cut off whatever it is that's causing you to go that direction, right? It's the same thing for somebody who has an issue with lust, and it could be an Instagram, it could be with whatever, but if you're constantly, if you're, if you're addicted to pornography, right, and the catalyst is having a cell phone, then you need to get rid of your cell phone. This is what Jesus taught, and these are harsh things, and these are difficult things. But we have it in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Jesus said, so if your eye, then he's talking about lust in this one specifically, but this applies to all sin. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to sin, or sorry, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's a harsh word. It sounds difficult, right? Who wants to lose their eye or their hand? But even more so, who wants to go to hell, right? Sometimes harsh works, and Jesus used that to make a point. It doesn't matter what it is in your life. If it is causing you to sin, then you need to get rid of it. That might be friends. That might be places you go. That might be routes that you drive. That could be anything in your life. Nothing is... You gotta ask yourself, is this thing that's causing me to sin greater than God, greater than my faith, greater than my desire to go to heaven? That's what we're really asking here. And the answer is it's not. You need to cut off anything that causes you to sin, regardless of what it is, whether it's people, whether it's anything. And I know that sounds like a hard word, and you may be thinking, but I want to save these people. Well, you're never going to be able to help them if you can't first help yourself. Get right. And then you can go back to them and hopefully help them and get them away from those things. But if you're still struggling with those things, you don't need to be around those people. Somebody else can help those people. You need to first get yourself right with God. You need to get yourself free from the chains of sin before you try to worry about the people who are causing you to sin. And that sounds harsh, that sounds difficult, but that's the truth. You have to get your own affairs in order before you can help to get somebody else's affairs in order. And if they're causing you to sin, you don't need to be around them anymore. Um, the cell phones are the gateway to so much sin. A lot of times we just think about it with lust, but they can be associated with greed, with pride, with anger, because you're constantly scrolling through the news and getting angry about things that you can't affect and that truly don't have that great of an effect on you because God is in control. I think that the best thing you can do if you have a problem with a cell phone is you may just not be able to have a cell phone. And I know that everybody in the world has a cell phone, but maybe you need to go back to a flip phone to where you don't have endless access to things that are going to cause you to sin in your hand. My pastor used to say that um, I would rather go to hell. I'm sorry, I would, he would not rather go to hell. He would rather go to heaven without a cell phone than to go to hell with a cell phone, right? I think that's a powerful statement. You, that's the decision that you're really facing. Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? If hell is going to be, if you're going to go, if a cell phone causes you to go to hell, then you need to get rid of the cell phone because it's much better to go to heaven without it. You don't need it. These are just extra things of life that we made it thousands and thousands of years without. And I'm pretty sure that you can still manage to not know the weather, to not know Facebook updates and things like that. It's probably pretty helpful to be able to make phone calls, but you can get a flip phone. You don't need the internet. And that's just the, the short answer of it. I'll be honest, like, 
I used to struggle with chewing tobacco and smoking, but, and so when I wanted to overcome those things, first of all, I finally had to make the decision that I actually want to do this, but then secondly, I had to start doing practical things, right? As much as I wanted God to deliver me, I still had to make practical decisions on how to overcome this, and the thing that I found was, at the time, I only, I only used cash. For everything that I did, I only used cash, and I honestly just stopped carrying cash. I mean, I couldn't go out to eat. I mean, I couldn't just make an easy trip to Walmart to go buy some stuff. Now, obviously, I was still living at home and things like that at the time, but so life was a little bit easier then than it is now as far as like money is concerned, but I made a decision. I'm not going to the gas station with any kind of extra money to buy this stuff because I'm tired of doing it and I'm tired of wasting money on it. And so I made a practical decision and thank God I've been free of that for years now, for you know a decade at this point. And I give God glory for that because if it wasn't for God giving me the strength to do it in the first place, then I still would have been carrying cash around with me, right? So we need God in it, but we're also going to have to make some practical choices still. And it's going to take God to help us to make those practical choices. Uh, another thing, too, to like get rid of something like that and replace it is my pastor tells a story about when he was a teenager, he used to smoke. This was before he came, well, this was when he first came to Christ, he was still struggling with smoking. And he kept praying and praying about it, but then finally... He decided that it would. It took five minutes, he said, to smoke a cigarette. And so every time he had the urge to smoke a cigarette, he would spend five minutes in prayer, and over time, that's what won his battle with smoking. So these are practical things with God's help that help us to overcome certain sins. And so you need to figure out what your sin is and figure out what causes you to have that sin and cut out whatever that is. If you can't watch movies, don't watch movies. If you can't go to certain places, don't go to those places. If you can't have certain friends, don't have those certain friends. It doesn't sound like something that you want to do, but it's the thing that you need to do in order to get the sin out of your life. That's just the simple, simple answer of it. Now, let's talk about armor, like we mentioned a second ago. If you want to survive a battle, you're going to need the armor. And God is able to supply us with all the armor for the spiritual battle that we face. It says it right there in the Bible. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, it says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, which is exactly what we need to do. Verse 12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. That's just to say, study your Bible. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from God's good news so that you will be fully prepared. That's knowing that you shall be saved through Christ and can defeat the enemy. 16. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. It means to be strong in what you believe. 17. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's confidence in being saved and holding on and knowing the Bible. And finally, verse 18. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers. That's what we need, right? If you want to overcome sin, if you want to be able to take on the devil, then we need to put on the armor of God. That's a very great passage. I want to just tell you what it is against Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It's so helpful. It, it helps us to understand sin. It helps us to understand the battle that we're facing with the enemy. And so we can do these very things in order to draw closer to God, in order to overcome sin. God has given us victory. He's given us the things that we need. And we have access to all the tools, all the armor that you need is in God's Word. Right? And we have to be prepared for this battle. If we're truly in a battle, then you're going to need these things. You know, you need to protect your head. You need to protect your body. You need to be able to withstand anything that the enemy is going to throw at you. And you can do that through what God has given us. It's really that simple. Let's move on to prayer. I think prayer has great effect, but it also requires us to be strong. We can't expect God to do what we're not willing to do for ourselves. That's what I was trying to mention earlier. Is So often we think that we can just take it to God and that God's going to solve the problem. God's going to make the desire and the urge to sin go away. But again, that doesn't prove anything. Right? That proves nothing. All it proves is that God's a good blocker, that God is good, to keep us from, is good at keeping us from things. But that's not how God operates. The way that God operates is that He gives us the opportunity to do things because that shows where our heart truly is. It shows us our will. If God kept us from everything, then we wouldn't have free will. 
we would have God's will in our lives, which is what we want to achieve, but we want to achieve it by choice and not by force. And God's, a, I've always heard it said that God is a gentleman, and so God doesn't force his will on us. He allows us to choose his will. And so that's what we really need to do. We need to choose God's will. We need to choose what God wants us to do, and what God wants you to do is to overcome sin. And so God's not going to completely stop those urges unless you are truly ready to give them up. Now, I do believe God is able to help us. He's able to strengthen us. But we have to be willing to make the decision for ourselves. I think that the Lord's Prayer is a good example. One of the last things that he says, that Jesus says, is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And God will honor such a prayer and keep us from temptation, but that only works when we are not choosing to walk down the path of temptation on our own accord, right? So that means, like, let's take somebody that struggles with lust, right? God is going to help you to overcome temptation if you pray and ask God to help you with that. However, if you still are following scantily clad people on Instagram and then expecting not to have lustful temptation towards that, you're all wrong. You're making a decision. First thing you need to do is unfollow those people or just delete Instagram in general, get away from those things, and then pray that prayer. But if you're still, you're not going to be able to just instantly walk down the halls of temptation and not be tempted just because you prayed a prayer, but your heart's not right. You need to get your heart right, and you need to stay out of those places, okay? It's a pretty simple thing to think about. I think that what God is trying to do is act as a roadblock. That means it puts an obstacle in your way. He doesn't completely stop you. If you think about any roadblock that you've ever seen before, they put a couple barriers out, but it's very easy to go around those barriers if you want to. And I think it's the same thing with God. Is God's going to put barriers in your life, but if you choose, you can climb over them, you can walk around them, and you can go down that sinful path. It's all about the choice that you have. God's not going to completely stop you. He's not going to tie you down to a chair and keep you from sinning. It's not going to be, you know, one of those breaks of uh, when they're trying to get somebody off of drugs and they just, like, lock them in a room so they can detox. That's not really how it works with God. God's going to not fully let you run into sin, but he's also not going to completely stop you because you have to prove what your heart says and the actions that you provide are going to show that it's the fruit of your life right are you producing good fruit or bad fruit that's the simple of it now the bible does say that god gives us a way out of temptation however still you know and still you're going to have to make the choice to take it it also says that we're not going to be tempted to pass what we can handle but you're going to be on the line of it right so i think that what it is is that the only way that this is going to help us, the way out that God provides, the only way that it's going to help us is if we have the strength and willingness to use it. And sometimes it is as simple as saying no to an invite to a bad situation or turning around and walking away when you begin to feel tempted to sin. That's the kind of way out that God offers you. God isn't like, you know, it's not like there's some grand thing. Sometimes we think it's going to be some grand thing when it's really like, no, the way out of temptation, the way out of sin is to just turn around and go the other direction. That's as simple as it is. That's that's what God is telling us. If if here's the way out, don't go in there, right? But sometimes we expect it to be something greater, something huge or massive, but that's really just not the case. I think too, if you want to overcome your battle with sin, we got to look at how Jesus won sin, and that's a great example that we have. Before Jesus starts his memory, or memory before Jesus starts his ministry, he's taken out into the wilderness by Satan and tempted. He actually is tempted, and he fasts and then is tempted. And so that's why the first thing that he comes to is with bread. But what we see in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, again, this is a little bit longer, but I think it really has a great impact on our ability. So it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. And during that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures also say people do not live by bread alone, but the scriptures say, sorry, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Now the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. 
All throughout that, what we see is that when the devil came at Jesus, Jesus turned to the scripture and used the scripture against the devil, which is exactly the same thing that we can do. And that's why I mentioned earlier that it's so important to know the scriptures that pertain to the sin that you struggle with. Because then you can turn and use those very same scriptures against the devil. When the devil is telling you to do something, when you're being tempted, then you say, no, because God's word says this. And you know that it is wrong. When we were reading Ephesians and we were talking about the armor of God, it said specifically that the armor of God includes the sword of the word. And that's what we see Jesus wielding in this moment. He was utilizing God's word in order to overcome the temptation of the devil. And we can do the very same thing. Now, if you also notice, there's a, there's a lot we can learn from this passage. The other thing that we can learn is that just because Jesus used the scripture once and took one blow at the devil, the devil didn't run away. You can think about it in terms of like some of the fighting games that you've played. Like, yeah, you're, you're sitting there and you're making direct hits to somebody, but you have to hit them more than once in order to win the game. We have to take more than one swing at the devil often before the devil's going to leave us alone. So just because you say that verse, that doesn't mean the devil's going to instantly leave you alone. You may have to say that verse a few times, or he may come at you with something else. And so you need to be prepared for whatever the devil's going to throw at you, just as Jesus was prepared. I think this is a big part of the reason that we have this verse, is to show us that when the devil comes at us, what we're able to do. But another thing is, that we learn from this passage, not in Matthew, but in the account that Luke has, is that the enemy never gives up. So even when we fully overcome temptation that plagues us, it's important to understand that the enemy hasn't left for good. He's retreated for a time to regroup and will return unexpectedly to try us again. This is shown in Luke 4.13 that says, When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. So what it's saying is that the devil was going to come back and tempt Jesus again. He was only leaving for a time to regroup. And if that's how it works for Jesus, then we can believe that it's going to be the same for us. So we must not allow ourselves to become weak in the waiting or start to think that we can no longer fall to that sin. Because the Bible says, take heed lest you fall, right? We need to remember that just because we've overcome it doesn't mean that we've overcome it for good. I think like, think about it like an addict, right? There's a lot of people who have gone through like AA and things like that and they've overcome these addictions. However, they have to remember for the rest of their life that they could go back to it. We can't forget that if we get too high and mighty in our own mind and forget that God gave us deliverance, that God helped us to get over it, even though we're doing some things on our own to help it, still all of this is coming through God's strength, right? We're simply showing a desire to overcome it by implementing these things, and God's actually helping us to be the one to overcome it, right? And so we have to remember that it, we could easily fall back into that sin again if we're not careful, so when, when the devil leaves, I think it's also another one of his tactics because now we think, oh, well, he got over that one and it's never going to come back and haunt us again. And then the devil comes back later and you're not prepared, you're weaker because you haven't kept your training up, right? And so I think that the devil's going to come back and he is going to be prepared and he is going to be ready. And if we're not ready, then we're going to fall. And so we have to constantly keep in our mind that we were once sinners, but we're saved by grace and we still are going to need God help, God's help to overcome sins. Now, the real question here is, do you want it? When I wanted to overcome chewing tobacco and cigarettes, when my pastor wanted to overcome cigarettes, when any person in history wanted to overcome sin or anything wrong in their life, it's the same thing as if you wanted to, get to, wanted to lose weight. You have to ask yourself, do you want it? Do you really want to overcome this sin? If you don't want to, then you're not going to overcome it because you're not going to put these things into action, because you're not going to pray, because you're not going to study to find it out. But those who really do want it are going to be the ones that overcome it. They're going to do the things that I've said so far, and they're going to do it. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to get rid of this sin? Because that's the only way that you're ever going to win the battle against your sin life is to really want it. If you don't want to stop sinning, then the simple truth is you'll keep on doing it. Only those who really want to rid themselves of wicked behavior will come out victorious. The reason that I'm doing this podcast right now is because I wanted to leave my sinful nature in the past. I wanted to overcome things. I wanted to defeat sin, and so I made an effort. And honestly, it took it takes a lot of removing things from your life. You know, there's just certain things that I don't do anymore because I know where those things lead. And you know what it is in your life that's leading you to sin, and if you want to overcome sin, then it's time to get those things out of your life because otherwise you're going to be in the same routine, the same rhythm, and you're never going to have victory. That's just the simple truth of it. So you have to decide if you really want it. And if you do want it, I believe that you can do it, that you can overcome it. 
And then once you have overcome it, I think it's so important that you train others. I mean, that's why I'm sitting here doing this podcast and sharing things with you. Um, I totally forgot a section because I actually didn't have it in my notes until I started the podcast, but that's accountability. So this is something that I think helps a lot of people. It seems like a great thing. It seems like something that I think a lot of people should do. And that's having people in your life that you're accountable to when it comes to sin. That you either talk with weekly, daily, and you talk about your struggles, or you talk about the temptation that you're facing. Or these are people you reach out to when temptation strikes, right? That help you. They keep you accountable, that you talk to, and that help you to overcome things, right? And so having a partner, the battle isn't won by individuals. It's won by a group of people. And so if you want to have victory, you need other people in your corner praying for you, which is biblical. And the Bible tells us to take our needs and our things before other people and have them pray for us. I think you can get deliverance from sin in that way as well. But also, like, it's just so good to be able to know, like, that you've got somebody in your corner, somebody behind you praying for you as well, and who you can call and say, I'm struggling so hard, I really want to do this sin. And so you you just you have that person that you can rely on. And then once you've overcome it, and then it's time to train other people and how they can win the battle. So you share your testimony. You tell others of what helped you to overcome the sin that plagued you in your life. I think a lot of times we're ashamed of our sins and ashamed of our past. And like, for rightfully so, we knew that we, we now realize that what we used to do was wrong, was wicked or evil, and that we were sinning against the creator of the universe. Like that obviously causes some things, but... We shouldn't be afraid to share those things and think that people are going to think less of us because we're all struggling with the same sort of things. And so what we should be doing instead is when we see new believers and they're struggling in certain things, we should be open and honest about what we struggled with, telling them how we overcame it so that they can help other people and so that they can overcome it as well. That's a very important thing that we need to do. And it's the truth of the matter is is that we need to be doing the, the same thing with our children. I think too often we think we need to teach our children and not train our children. And in that also, I think we don't tell them the truth that we had struggles, that we had issues, that we did these things. And so we we struggle, honestly, to be able to articulate to them our sins. We're, we're still ashamed, but also, I really just don't know how to word this. It's like, they, like, I think, I think parents want to have their kids think of them a certain way. And I think that we think too often, like, if we tell them what we did, that's only going to cause them to do it. But I think in reality, we actually end up doing the opposite. Because we are not honest about the sins that we committed and that we struggled in those ways and the hurt and the pain and the struggle and how hard it was to come out of them, that the kids don't understand properly and they end up doing the same things. And so I think we need to be very purposeful in training them and not just in teaching because teaching is like a lesson here and there. I mean, like we need to be purposeful in training, like daily training, regular training for our children so that they can understand the truth of the gospel, so they can understand what sin is and how we overcame sin, because they're going to need that knowledge just like you need that knowledge right now. But we have to be careful when others, when we help others to overcome sin, because we could easily slip into that same behavior once again. This is actually clearly written out in our Bibles. In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourselves. That's kind of frightening, right? Like, it makes me think, like, well, maybe I don't want to help somebody overcome sin because I don't want to go back into sin. I don't want to be where I once was. I'm finally safe. I am finally got out of it. I don't think that's exactly what it means. It just means what it says, and that's to be careful and do it in a gentle and humble manner. I think a lot of times, even as Christians, we struggle with humility and with being gentle. Sometimes we want to condemn people who are in sin, but the truth is we're just as easily able to fall into that sin as somebody else is. So I think what it really means is that we we help these people, but by avoiding pride. So like Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destructions, pride goes before destruction, and haughtiness before a fall. I'm going to take a minute here. I'm going to be doing another video. I'm trying to do more and more content. But like this whole time I've been struggling in this, not about like overcoming sin. I'm not struggling in that area like through this podcast. I believe what all this stuff says is true. I really don't want to put on in these podcasts or put on in the videos that I do. I just want to be real and genuine and unique. And I am trying to read off notes, but I find this to be such an important issue that I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to like skip over things or leave things out that I feel like God's put on my heart. So I've been trying to read notes 
and honestly just like struggling a little bit with this, but I just want it to be real. So that's why I've left all these mistakes in here up until this point. That's why I've left all these things is I don't want it to be a fake podcast, but trying to say this verse again. So Proverbs 16 and 18 says that pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. That means that when we build ourselves up and we think that we're better than everybody else, that's when we're going to fall, right? Because we don't think we can fall, we do fall. So when we go to help other people in sin, we don't need to have that mindset. 1 Corinthians 10, 12-13 says the same thing. It says, if you think you are standing strong, then be careful not to fall. The temptation in your life, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out that you can endure. Right. So that's one of the verses I actually referenced earlier when talking about a way out. But I think it's interesting that He says that those who think that they are standing strong should be careful not to fall because the temptation in your life is no different than what others are facing. So we sometimes put different levels of sin in things. And honestly, like, there's a lot of sin, but the sins that get the most publicity, I feel like, are the issues with the whole homosexual agenda and everything that goes on there. And that is a sin, and it's an open sin, and it's a bad sin. But there's also a lot of other sins and the sin that you struggle with is no better or worse than the sin that that person is struggling with, and they, we shouldn't look at them that way. What we should be looking at is, I'm doing wrong, or have done wrong, and they're currently doing wrong, but God can accept them, right? So we don't even think that we're better than them, because that's only going to cause us to fall. We just need to realize that we're all equal. We're all struggling. The devil's using all of us for wickedness. Actually, let me see if I can find a verse here next to me, and that kind of goes along in this same vein. Um, that I was reading earlier and have been dealing with just in my mind, and I think it helps us to understand how we should deal with people who have fallen to sin. It's here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. It says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change their hearts, and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. That's what we need to look at sinful people and realize, is that they're being held captive by the enemy, doing what he wants them to do, just like when we were lost in sin, we didn't realize what we were doing. They don't understand. They don't know God. They don't know God's word. And we can't expect them to do so. So when we come to them, we don't need to be arrogant. We don't need to be proud, acting like we're the reason that we don't live such sinful lifestyles. The only reason we're free of sin is because we do know God, and they need that knowledge. If they knew God like you knew God, then they wouldn't be sinning in that way. So when we go to help people, this is what we need to remember, is that they that they are in the devil's trap, and they have been held captive by him to do what he wants. And they're living a sinful lifestyle because the devil wants them to live a sinful lifestyle. They're doing what the devil desires. We need to realize that if they know God, then they won't want to live that way anymore. So we don't need to condemn them. We don't need to treat them like they're the enemy, even though they're, they're the catalyst for a lot of wicked things that are taking place in this world. Sinful people want sinful things to be legal and to be accepted because then they won't feel bad about their sin. But if they only knew the truth, then they would realize that their past was wrong and that they would do the opposite. And we see that so many times when we see... These people who used to live super sinful lifestyles, regardless of what it was, and then they come out later. Uh, I think a great version of that is the woman who now fights against abortion that used to be very deeply involved in abortion. I guess that would be in the pro-choice movement. She came out strongly against it now, and I think that's because at some point in her life, somebody came to her that was a Christian and helped her to see the truth in the right way and helped her share it, but they didn't do it in a rude, arrogant way, because all that does is shut people down. They did it in a gentle, humble way, and it helped them. So we need to be careful when we help other people with sin. I do believe that you can overcome sin, but when we do overcome it, we need to be careful. And so that's what I want to talk about finally. That's how I want to finish up this thing, is that you can do this. First of all, I pray to God that you've listened to this whole rambly podcast, and I hope that it's helped you in some way, but I also just want to be clear, you can overcome sin. I've over... I have overcome a lot of battles with sin in my life, and that's not to say that I'm perfect. That's not to say that I'm not without fault. But I have definitely gotten rid of the practices that I once had, and it was through God's grace, and it was through putting some of the Bible into action, putting the things like that are listed in this, cutting things off, taking things out of my life, changing the way that I do things, 
knowing the verses about what I struggled with. Those things are going to help you. But you can do this. God's not a respecter of persons. And it says that God, that Jesus Christ came so that all people could be saved. That means that you can be saved, that you can be free from your addictions, free from your sins, free from whatever it is that plagues you. You can have victory in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. I truly believe that. The devil has been defeated. God has already won. And so we can have that victory through Jesus Christ. I mean, that's amazing to think about. The battle's already been won. The battle's already been fought. Jesus died. He rose again. He took our sins on the cross. And praise God, we are free. Hallelujah. You can overcome sin if you want to. Remember that. If you, if you, that might be something you need to tell yourself. I, I want to be better than this. I want to overcome this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. That's, that's going to make a massive impact in your life. It's going to be a massive impact in what you do. So I just I pray for you that God would give you victory in Jesus' name over your sins. I pray that he would help you, God. I pray, I pray, God, that you would help these people that listen to this podcast, God, those who truly want to overcome sin. I pray that the words of this podcast would stick in their minds and their hearts, that they would think of what they need to give up, what they need to get away from, God. I pray that you would give them strength. I pray that you would give them understanding. I pray that you would just touch their hearts and their minds, and may they be a blessing to others, God, that they can help many other people have a great testimony of overcoming sin as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's like one thing I just want to say. Like as The more that I talk, the more that I think of that I want to say, but like, I believe that that's such a big part of our lives with Christ. Everything we face and everything that we overcome is to the purpose to help other people do the same. And I think that what you need to realize is that there's people around you who are willing and able to help you overcome your sin. And then once they've helped you, you can turn around and give freely to someone else what you were freely given. It's a great blessing when you get to do that too. I'm so glad that you guys joined me on this podcast. I apologize for the rambling and everything like that. I should have just came out. Like that's how I need to start just introing the podcast. Welcome to a podcast where I try to be real. I try to do my best to just be who God's created me to be and to just share with you what I feel like God's put in my heart. And today that was how to win your battle with sin. And I hope this blesses you. I hope it finds you well in Jesus' name. And I pray that you guys have a rest, great rest of your day. God bless.